Good afternoon. It's time for another episode of American Literature and Writing and 11th and 12th Grade English Online. I hope that this uh, lecture finds you well. It's going to be posted for you to watch on Monday, April the 20th, which is, uh, I suppose we're getting into our second month now of, uh, of doing uh, this remote learning process. Thursday, we had our Zoom meeting, which uh, I hope those of you who were able to attend enjoyed. I, uh, I know I was happy to see your smiling faces uh, and those that weren't smiling as well. And uh, we, we had a little bit of a laugh there. Uh, I need to tell those of you who were there that uh, Miss Muniz had uh, had some technical issues getting logged on, but she did have a submission, and uh, I'm going to tell all of you that she made me laugh. I will uh, send that out to you later on for all of you to enjoy and congratulate Miss Muniz uh, because I really thought it was funny. Other than that. Uh, we are proceeding on with with reading the moviegoer and with doing your your final end of course essays or at least i hope you're proceeding with them we'll talk a little bit about that in a in a few minutes uh some deadlines that are coming up let's take a look at these for you to be aware of uh assuming you are watching this on Monday, the 20th, the date that it's scheduled, uh, you should either have turned in or be ready to turn in your final detailed outline of, the, uh, uh, of your paper, which should include specific examples uh, from the things we've read about each of your characters and, and support what you're going to say about them. Uh, I will be reviewing those and getting them back to you as quickly as I can during the week. Uh, but don't wait for me to get started writing, because a week from today, uh, assuming you're watching it on Monday, April the 20th, on April the 27th, I want to see the first draft of your papers. You need to turn those in to me. I will uh, read them and try to uh, correct and comment on them as uh, promptly as I can. If you are able to submit those in Word format to me, uh, I, can, uh, I can use Word to, uh, to make comments and, and suggestions on your draft and send them back to you. Otherwise, I'll print them and I'll write on them with my red pen and scan them and send them back. But uh, do be working on those uh, because uh, we don't have just a tremendous amount of time. Uh, so, so be getting started. On Monday, May the 4th, I will want to see your second drafts. And you may be sitting here saying, wait a minute. What's this about a second draft? Well, we have talked uh, repeatedly about uh, the process of rewriting, and uh, you should expect to have to do some rewriting on your papers. So we'll do a second draft, which I'll look at and get back to you as quickly as possible. And then Monday, May 11th, which is... Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, roughly three weeks from from this from Monday, April the twentieth. I want to see your final papers. They need to be turned in. That will give me time to grade them and comment on them and get them back to you. Now, uh, Monday, May the eighteenth, I am considering. I'm not sure I'm going to. Uh, uh, chances are I won't. Uh, but uh, I'm considering doing a Zoom meeting for us to discuss uh, your papers and any questions that you might have about them, any questions you have about the things that we read. Uh, 
let me know about that. And then uh, uh, Monday, May 21st, is what would have, not Monday, that's a Thursday, May 21st, is what would have been our final time together if we were still meeting. And uh, we may try to find some way to mark that date. Uh, and that's especially so since it will serve as a sort of milestone for two of our number. That's Miss Hill and Mr. Crouch. Uh, so uh, uh, be thinking about that. Perhaps we can, we can think of some, some way to commemorate that occasion. I don't know what it will be. Um, so though that, that's the schedule as things come up. Uh, that's the work we're going to be doing. Now then, your reading assignment for the week is part five of The Movie Goer and the epilogue. Now this is very short. Part five is like 15 pages and the epilogue is not that long, maybe 10 or 11. You can do this. Uh, it shouldn't take you long at all to read, but it should take you a lot of time to think about, I hope, uh, and consider it as as we're uh, we're writing. I, I want to get this done because I hope uh, next week to be able to assign Revelation as your reading assignment so that we can talk about that a little bit uh, before you have to write about it. So that's what you're doing. Now then, for your writing assignments, your outline should be complete. Uh, in pretty extensive detail, and you need to be writing your first drafts. Now, let me tell you that just because this is a first draft doesn't mean it gets to be sloppy. Uh, make it look good. Uh, you're typing it, you're using your word processor, so there is no excuse for you not to use the spell checker and there is no excuse for you not to use the grammar feature. Uh, so m make me proud of you as you turn these in and let's, let's treat this like we think it's serious because it is. Now, I know that you're going to have trouble finishing drafts about the last part of your paper because you haven't finished the movie goer yet and you probably haven't started Revelation. But you should finish the moviegoer this week. If, if you get busy reading it, I don't see why you couldn't. If you've been keeping up uh, and have read what's been assigned, I don't see why you couldn't finish reading what's left in an hour, uh, and that would give you time to think about it and, and fit it into your paper. Uh, so be writing, even though you're not finished, and write what you can. Uh, and then submit it, and uh, you, you don't necessarily need to wait for me to get back to you to start rewriting it. Uh, let me tell you a little tidbit uh, about something. Uh, uh, Mr. Percy, our author, wrote the moviegoer four times before he turned it into a, a prospective publisher. Four times. Think about that. Uh, what makes you think your first draft of anything is going to be worth reading if, if someone with, with uh, the level of talent he has has to write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite? Um, now that's, that's an interesting comment because the fact is that to some degree uh, the whole notion of talent is a myth. Uh, it's just hard work and uh, that's what it takes. And, and you can write something good, you can do a good job, but you have to work. So uh, uh, be doing it. Now then, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about part four of the moviegoer. Let, let me tell you that Thursday, uh, Thursday's lecture, I hope, is going to involve discussions of your outlines and, and what can be done to improve them. Uh, so I don't know that we'll talk about our book much on Thursday. We'll see. 
But let's talk about part four of the moviegoer. And this won't be long, but uh, uh, we'll continue on with it. You will remember mm -hmm. the structure of the book. It's, it's divided into five parts that spread out over, over a period of one week that will end on Ash Wednesday. And of course, the day before that is, uh, is, the, is a Tuesday, and it's the day known in New Orleans where our novel is set as Mardi Gras. So the novel runs from a Wednesday to a Wednesday, and each part covers a specific period of time during that week. Uh, part four covers the period from Saturday morning until uh, late Sunday afternoon. That's the time period we're dealing with. We've, we've talked a little bit about that. Now, remember, uh, uh, well, no, that, you know, I was wrong. That, I was wrong. That was part three that was Saturday to Sunday evening. Part four is from Sunday evening until late Tuesday night. That's the time period we're covering, which, of course, includes the Mardi Gras celebration that Binks misses because he's been sent to a stockbroker's convention in Chicago. But remember what's coming up, uh, Wednesday is, is important for two reasons. First of all, it's Binks' 30th birthday. And he has made a promise to his aunt to meet her at her house and tell her what he's going to do with his life on his 30th birthday. Then, of course, it is also Ash Wednesday. So... Uh, that's what's coming up. Now, up and so remember, part four is taking place from Sunday evening until late Tuesday night. Now, up until now, throughout the book, we have been seeing little, little, little hints uh, and little tidbits uh, that that allude. A-L-L-U-D-E. That's in your little book, in your Strunk and White. Look up the difference between an illusion and an illusion. But we've seen a, a number of things that allude to the classical tradition, to Greeks and Rome and, and all of that sort of thing. Uh, we, we see Aunt Emily and her, uh, her to my mind, somewhat... Uh, uh, improbable uh, interest in Stoic philosophy and uh, quotations from Marcus Aurelius and uh, talk about Greeks and Romans. Uh, and uh, then we saw it in part three in the, the image of Sharon Kincaid as a sort of a redneck Aphrodite uh, rising up from the surf in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but we've seen these, these uh, classical uh, elements in here. Uh, you will remember that I asked you in, in one of our last lectures that if Sharon was Aphrodite, then who is Kate? Who, who, are, who are we supposed to think about her as being? Well, that question is not something you really have to guess at because it gets answered in part four. And it relates back to something that Binks said, I guess, in part two, but it, but it relates to something that we, the question gets answered in part four. We're told who, who Kate is. Um, so uh, if you're listening to this and you tell me, I will know, send me an email. Tell me who Kate is, who Kate is supposed to make us think of. And uh, I'll know that you're reading. Uh, if, if you don't, I will suspect that you're not. So I hope I hear from a few of you. Uh, also in part four, we're going to see a, uh, a, a shift from classical references to, uh, to a sort of a review or a thought or, or a focus 
on the romantic sensibility. And you remember us talking about the difference between the classical and the romantic, and how the romantic is uh, is obsessed with uh, uh, the exotic, the strange, the unusual, uh, death, disease, mental illness, and that it also is is very very. Uh, interested in art for art's sake and the idea of beauty uh, uh, and by that not like uh, the physical beauty of a person but uh, of the beauty of art and music and nature and, and that kind of a thing. Um, we see that play out somewhat in, uh, in part four in a number of things. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what happens Remember that uh, that uh, at the end of part three, uh, it becomes clear that Binks' pursuit of Sharon has, uh, has come to an end, and she tells him to take her home because she has to meet somebody. And so he does. Uh, he, he takes her home so that she can meet her somebody. Um, and then he goes on to Aunt Emily's house where uh, we find a couple of things. First of all, we find that a character named Sam Yerger has arrived. Now, now to me, this, is, this guy is a ridiculous character. Uh, I, I, and I don't mean that to, uh, to, to uh, pick on, on Percy or on the book. The character is very well portrayed. But he's a ridiculous person. Um, he is uh, uh, some kind of not relative of the family, but uh, has been connected to the family in various ways for a long time. He's uh, he's he's a sort of a uh, uh, I guess you would say he's a professional intellectual. Uh, he has worked as a newspaper correspondent. He's written a couple of, of books that have been published and received varying degrees of attention. And he apparently travels around giving lectures in different cities. So he, he is sort of, a, uh, sort of an Emerson type of character. And he is, to my mind, just about as ridiculous as Emerson himself is, to my mind. Uh, but we show up and he's, he's hiding, skulking outside, waiting to meet Binks. And we learn that uh, Kate has reached a point that is, is something of a crisis for her. And uh, although it's not quite so clear cut, the, the truth is that Binks is also approaching a crisis of sorts in his life. But, but Kate's is more acute. She has, uh, uh, according to Emily and Sam Yerger, she has tried to kill herself by drinking whiskey and uh, taking uh, tranquilizers. Um, but she didn't die. Um, and Sam thinks he has the cure for what's, what's wrong with Kate uh, and needs to manage, needs Binks to help him manage it. And um, inconceivably enough, his idea, uh, and, and I want you to think about this because I think this, this will tell you just why it is that I think that, that Sam is such an absurd person. Um, his idea of dealing with with a young woman who he believes to be suicidal and, and taking drugs and having all sorts of problems is to send her to live in New York with some woman who she doesn't know but who he calls the princess. Uh, and this, despite his describing the scene where, she, uh, where Kate wakes up from her drug-induced stupor and is extremely hostile to everyone, but he wants to pack her off to live with some old lady that she doesn't know. Uh, uh, to me, this is a dumb idea. Uh, uh, I, I can't 
you know, and I think we're supposed to see it as a dumb idea. But that's, that's what, uh, what uh, Sam wants to do. And then we get this depiction of this absolutely preposterous uh, dinner table discussion with Sam and Aunt Emily and uh, the country cousins from Feliciana Parish, uh, Uncle Oscar and, uh, and uh, Aunt, uh, whatever her name is, Edith, I think it is, uh, where uh, Sam and Emily go off on these rapturous flights of emotion about seeing this opera and that uh, play and that performance and all of their wonderful high-blown, highfalutin conversation. Uh, uh, a real, almost a parody of, of romanticism, uh, all taking place while they've got this suicidal young woman upstairs. And uh, then, or at least they think she's suicidal, although she denies it. And then we see Sam go up to, to try to bring Kate down to dinner. Uh, and they sit and they have their discussion in the little side seating room uh, where Kate tells us that she feels great and that she didn't want to die. She just wanted a buzz. And uh, now whether that's true or not, who knows? And they have a lengthy discussion uh, where, where Kate basically talks about how excited and thrilled and stimulated she had been by her long artistic uh, cultural type conversation with Sam and Aunt Emily the evening before, uh, but then decides to uh, mix, mix alcohol and tranquilizers. Uh, she discusses her most recent uh, uh, meeting with, with her uh, psychiatrist, uh, and, and then she does something else which is to invite herself along on Binks's trip to Chicago uh, to the stockbrokers convention. Remember, Binks has proposed marriage to her, and she's talking like it might be possible in certain circumstances, and she invites herself along on this trip uh, and then decides that she doesn't want to take the plane the next day and wait until the morning so she goes and arranges tickets on the train, uh, and she and Binks go off and, and get off on the train bound for Chicago uh, without telling anyone. Uh, they, they then travel along, and at this point we, we see well, this, this is pretty long, and y'all have read it, but uh, during the train conversation, Kate basically throws herself at Binks uh, and uh, uh, we're left, though, to wonder exactly what happened uh, through all of this. Uh, certainly, it was their intention to... Uh, uh, engage in, in some extramarital behavior that they should not have been doing. Um, but we're left to ask exactly what happens. Binks tells us that flesh failed them. Uh, and, and you remember in the lead up to that, Kate tells us that she had told her psychiatrist that she, she just wanted to have a random sexual encounter. And it appears that she settled on Binks as her partner in that. Um, Binks tells us that flesh failed them. We, we don't know exactly what he means by that, except that we know that this last final uh, desperate attempt by Kate to, uh, to make, to accomplish something with herself, to, to relieve herself of her problems, has failed. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, not worked. It's a disaster. And, and Binks talks a little bit in part four about the whole uh, 
the whole issue of sin as he perceives it in, in modern times, that it's more an effort to, to feel something than it is anything else. And that he, uh, 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 he, he, he talks about his, his uh, friends that he hiked the Appalachian Trail with, uh, trying to convince themselves that they were having a good time. And then here's, here's this episode with Kate uh, that comes to be not a whole lot of anything. Uh, then they get to Chicago where they spend a, a period of time. They go and, and uh, try to add a little reality to their experience by calling on a friend of Binks's uh, that does not go well. Uh, it's, it's during this interlude in Chicago that Binks tells us who Kate is, or who we're supposed to think who Kate is. Uh, then they get the message that uh, uh, the family at home is furious because uh, they've been frantically looking for Kate and couldn't find her. Uh, and then, then uh, figured out what happened when they found both of their cars at the train station. So they have to go home. They can't uh, uh, get a train. So the last part of part four is taking up, taken up with this lengthy bus ride uh, from Monday night through to late Tuesday night uh, uh, from Chicago to New Orleans. Uh, on the bus ride, Binks uh, encounters a romantic, uh, a young man about to finish college, taking some time off to go have an adventure, he thinks, uh, heading to New Orleans, uh, who, he identi who Binks identifies as a romantic. Uh, and he tells us that by the way that he re the, the young man kind of self-consciously tries to sit casually and act casually and uh, all of that. And he makes an, an interesting comment about him that I, I think we can compare to, to someone else uh, that, that he says that uh, the poor fellow, he has just begun to suffer from it. This miserable trick the romantic plays on himself of setting just beyond his reach the very thing he prizes. Uh, think about that. Uh, um, compare that to Gatsby, standing on the beach reaching out for the green light that he can never quite grasp. Uh, Remember we asked, just what was Gatsby? Was he a romantic? Was he, what was he? Um, and, and what, we don't know. But the trip continues. They arrive in New Orleans late at night. The parades are all over. The uh, street crews are out cleaning up. And they decide to walk from the bus station to the train station, I suppose, to get their cars. And uh, at the very end, we see uh, across the street the romantic uh, gazing in shop windows and wandering off by himself. Uh, I, I wonder if that's not somehow meant to signify to us that uh, Binks and uh, Percy have written romanticism off as a way to live, as, as uh, a way to stick yourself in the world is the way Binks puts it. And uh, that's the end of part four. Uh, give it some thought. Tell me who Kate is. Who does Binks compare Kate to? Um, I'll talk to you again soon. Uh, get those outlines in if you haven't already and be writing. Uh, and we'll talk again soon.